My name is Nick Cleese. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm an Iowa farm kid who became a high school teacher who became a lecturer in first year writing. And when I was born in 1992, atmospheric CO2 levels were 356 parts per million. That's just six above the threshold that gave 350 its name and mission. Um, we share that mission, Merrick and I. Um, and I want to give Merrick a chance to introduce himself in full as well. So Merrick. Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, it's kind of weird that we don't see people in the audience, but it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, my name is Marek. Um, I was born in Poland in 1970 when atmospheric PPM was 325, so well below the safe threshold. Um, I'm professor of a comparative literature and professor of children's literature, and I also serve as director for the Center for Climate Literacy. And um, it's great. It's great pleasure to be here with you tonight. Um, we will share a vision of a big project that we're developing here with a large team of um, scholars at the University of Minnesota. And we hope to share our excitement about the potential that this vision and this work can bring. Yeah, so our plan for tonight is to share with you this vision, uh, which we see as a grassroots revolution in education that can in turn help accelerate a transition to an ecological civilization. Um, yeah, so this is a vision that's been evolving over the past year and a half, two years from folks at the University of Minnesota and around the world, um, as well as teachers in education and the humanities um, as our collective response to the failures of our current education system to address the climate emergency um, in a way that would actually empower young people to achieve a livable future. Um, so what we're about to propose is not a silver bullet that's going to solve the climate emergency. We don't believe that there is one single silver bullet, but this is our intervention. Um, and we do know that what we propose is scalable um, and it can be implemented by any teacher in any classroom, any subject area at all grade levels. In fact, it should be implemented. And we believe these strategies have the capacity to help young people grasp the human planetary predicament that we are in called the Anthropocene and design a green, clean, just, and fair world we all wanna see. Um, so this talk is organized, organized around two modules. The first, um, we will outline our vision and strategic assumptions. And the second, we'll introduce the Center for Climate Literacy um, and talk a little bit about our projects. Throughout, um, we'll do a few read alouds. Um, so you can think to the last time that you had a picture book read to you and relish uh, in the chance that you'll get three read to you tonight. Um, to give you a hands-on experience of what climate literacy education actually means in practice and to see that stories are both fun and serious work. Um, we'll also have ample time for Q&A at the end, but please ask questions in the Q&A along the way. You can find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen um, and know that we'll get to as many as we can at the end. All right, so we wanna start with our strategic assumptions. And these are three points that are not non-obvious, but they are fundamental to our vision of work at the center. And these points are at the heart of the game plan that we propose. So we will talk briefly about one, the difference between climate literacy and climate science literacy. This difference is overlooked, but it's critical to consider if we're serious about building a climate literate society. Two, we will talk about language, about language as a technology, about how we human beings live in language and what this means for our efforts at building an ecological civilization. And three, we will talk about systems change as it applies to education and how it connects to uh, our vision. And this will be the transition to introduce the center and our projects. So imagine if God came to earth came to earth, looked around, and was dismayed at what humanity has done to the beautiful, clean, and biodiverse world God had created. Imagine God asks two children to tell adults to go and fix it. And God tells the children to tell the adults that God demands it. 
Imagine the children talking to the bankers and governments, then to religious leaders, then to the military, and then to crowds of ordinary people. Who do you think you are telling us what to do? Each group demands. But it is God who said you must do it, the children reply. Oh, if it's God who said we must do it, then of course we'll change our way. That's no, no big deal. Each group responds. And then the people transform the world. So we actually have a story like this. It's a 1999 picture book called What Do You Mean? by British author John Birmingham. And this is a great example. And this is the story. And so it came to pass that the men with money stopped cutting the trees, dirtying the waters, and fouling the air. And the people who, and those who spoke for God, stopped quarreling among themselves. And the men in uniforms who had the guns and the bombs that hurt and killed people threw them away. And the people who stood by and took no notice of what was happening to the world changed their ways. And those who didn't have enough to eat had enough to eat. And the world became a better world. This is a great example of a story which shows that people change, not because they have new factual information, but because are, they are motivated to deeply care about the work that needs to happen. And this is the world that this book imagines. This is a perfect world. And this excerpt from What Do You Mean? Uh, and this personal connection gets us into the first key point that we want to make in this presentation, which is that definitions matter. Now, climate literacy itself can be understood in two different ways. The first can be understood through a, a more narrow and technical scientific competence. Um, and the second is a more holistic sociocultural competence. And both are correct and both are important. Um, yet they each lead to very different outcomes. Um, and these outcomes uh, are what make a difference. Um, the science-focused definition, which you see on the screen right now, was first proposed by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, in 2007 in a brochure they put out called Climate Literacy, colon, The Essential Principles of Climate Science. Um, and after this webinar, Babette and Larry will share out um, a resource guide that Merrick and I put together that will include um, that brochure, as well as all the other references that we um, mentioned in this presentation. So um, under NOAA's definition, climate literacy is a synonym for climate science literacy, and in effect means learning about the science behind climate research and the science behind how Earth systems work. Um, or as NOAA puts it, uh, climate literacy means, quote, an understanding of your influence on climate and climate's influence on you and society. Um, and by and large, research continues to view climate literacy in this way, which is as a science competence. But the second definition of climate literacy is a more holistic definition. Um, and this has a much longer ancestry. Um, some ideas that are in the scholarship go back to the original definition of environmental education in the 1960s. And since then, newer ideas have been um, articulated, especially in the mid 90s, like with David Orr. Um, and his book, Earth in Mind, and then UN's various frameworks like the Millennium Development Goals and then the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, both of these UN frameworks included an educational component called, um, you know, variations on the term education for sustainability, like education for sustainable development uh, or environmental and sustainability education. Um, our work at the center builds on this holistic tradition. Um, and so we in, sort of include NOAA's definition within ours, uh, but we define climate literacy as an understanding of the climate emergency that includes facts and figures like climate science, um, but focuses primarily on developing values, attitudes, and behavioral change aligned with becoming good earthlings and safeguard the earth's integrity in the present and for future generations. Okay, and you might wonder, What's really the difference here? So if you take the NOAA's definition, understanding your influence on climate and climate's influence on you and society, Exxon, Chevron, 
BP, all other fossil fuel companies have been fully climate literate since at least the 1970s. They were some of the best informed actors on the planet. They were well ahead of governments and the general public. And there is a ton of research showing this. Uh, they knew the numbers. They knew the science. They were doing their own cutting edge research. They also knew the consequences. This is from an article from 2015. Uh, listing very specific steps in specifically in relation to Exxon, what they knew. So they knew the consequences for the planet and living system. And this one report they Exxon received in 1979, and these are the last two lines of this um, of this screenshot you're, you're now watching, uh, uh, that this will produce effects which will be indeed catastrophic, at least for a substantial fraction of the Earth's population. So they knew this back in the 70s. Why didn't they act? Why are they delaying pushing back and slow walking climate action today, 50 years later? Do you think that they are doing it because they don't understand climate science? No, it's because their values, attitudes, and goals are not aligned with safeguarding the Earth's integrity. They're aligned with something else. So, you know, when you think about big oil, their agents being fully climate literate in the scientific sense for at least 50 years, and it made no difference. But as long as they are climate illiterate in the social cultural sense, this narrow climate literacy is simply not enough. We need this larger social cultural climate literacy that can act on behalf of life, even or especially against profit-driven market forces that legitimize destruction. And we put these two images on the screen. One on the, on the left, you see Canadian rationale for expansion of a pipeline that they need this pipeline to have more money to fight climate change. That's the kind of logic. And this is climate illiteracy in action. It just gets as absurd as Kafka. And on the right, you see a screenshot of the Ecuadorian referendum in August this year, when citizens of Ecuador decided to keep millions of barrels of oil underground, choosing to lose money in favor of preserving the Northern Amazon rainforest, which is one of the most biodiverse regions on the planet. That is the kind of climate literacy that we need. And this is the kind of climate literacy we need to nourish. So, at the Center for Climate Literacy at the University of Minnesota, we believe that achieving universal climate literacy and thus helping to transition to an ecological civilization is possible only when we approach climate literacy as a broad sociocultural competence as the Ecuadorians did. Such a competence includes the, includes the science component so that we understand the science behind it, but we also focus on developing values, attitudes, and behavioral change. Such climate literacy is available to all of us humans, all of us earthlings, and at a very early age. Um, and as educators, Merrick and I and the folks at the center believe, and well, we know that it can be scaffolded and in integrated across all subject areas, all grade levels, and in schools everywhere. Okay, our second point is another non-obvious notion which is that humans are creatures of language. And we kind of know it, but we rarely think about what this actually means. And sometimes we believe that we humans are creatures of reason, but we only happen to be creatures of reason from time to time. Um, we have somewhat become more aware of being creatures of language recently with the race of fake news, conspiracy theories, information siloing, echo chambers, email phishing, and all of these other forms of language-based manipulation that, that exist in the media sphere, which is increasingly becoming an ecosystem we inhabit in everyday life. But in my field, in literature studies, in linguistics, in other fields, in the humanities and social sciences, there is a massive body of research showing how language shapes our perceptions and how our perceptions shape our actions. A lot of advertising and, and all of AI algorithms used for targeting, uh, targeted ad advertising, all of these are built on language models, which are correlated with predictable behavioral pattern. So the notion is take control of someone's language and you control the way they think, what they see and how they act. So in fact, I personally believe that 
perhaps the most accurate way of helping us grasp the importance of this point is to say that we live in language the same way as we live in our bodies. Imagine if someone else controlled your body. Imagine they made you see only the things they wanted you to see or that they walked you physically to only places they want you to be in. So like our bodies allow us to see things, grasp, move things, orient ourselves in space, move in space to other places, so too is with language. Even single words do this work, but especially stories. Stories, cognitive scientists say, are the most complex knowledge structures based on language. Stories allow us to notice processes and connection, uh, connections among these processes. They allow us to grasp meanings, implications, their importance. They allow us to orient ourselves in relation to ideas, to beliefs, to values, and also to move from one position or understanding to another position or understanding. And, and we, we actually, in language, we, we use these metaphors of moving, changing sides, moving in, in our understanding, growing in our understanding. So language is literally our operating system, our core software. And our human brains, we know this for a fact, evolved for narrative understanding. Language is also the most advanced technology our species has developed for navigating reality. And, and one of the most recent excellent overviews of language as this fundamental technology uh, is uh, it can be found in Yuval Noah Harari Sapiens, which is a fantastic book. I absolutely recommend it. And this is available to the general, to a general audience. So Harari talks about language and especially stories as a technology that creates, maintains, and transforms human societies. So, okay, what are the implications of this understanding that language is a technology and humans are, and humans are creatures of language? So we briefly want to talk about two implications here. And I will talk about the first. Um, which is that the very idea of climate change is mediated through language. Even the terms used um, to describe it um, are inherently uh, political. And as Merrick said, the single terms, one or two words, um, drastically shape our realities. So you might be well familiar with the debates that arise from this. Um, some people prefer to use um, the term climate emergency instead of climate change. Climate deniers might say that, well, you know, the climate's been changing for hundreds of thousands of years. So what's the big deal? You know, et cetera. Um, and scientists, um, because they are um, sort of constrained by disciplinary conventions, might prefer a more specific technical term like global warming instead of a more unprecise uh, term like climate change. But these terms matter a lot when we talk about them um, as a collective um, including in science, because science is also mediated through language. Um, so you, you may have also heard that um, the IPC, IPCC and NOAA and other scientific bodies um, uh, use different words, and they have pressures that are external to them, but also internal to those bodies. Um, and in most cases, a lot of these debates revolve around using terms that aren't going to alarm the public, right? Um so in just last month, um, James Hansen, who was the first climate scientist to testify about the climate crisis in front of uh, the U.S. Congress, um, Hansen and his team published a new article titled Global Warming in the Pipeline. And you see a screenshot of that article on the left. And we'll link that article in the resource guide that we send out. It's open access. Um, in which they say that the emergency is much more serious than the IPCC lets on, but that they've been pressured to tone down the language they use. Um, and Dr. Hansen has a recent... Um, interview, I think it was just last week, um, which he talks about the edit editors of this journal, Oxford Open Climate Change, um, insisted that he change statements like two degrees warming is dangerous to two degrees could be dangerous. And so um, we get that sort of fuzzy play that has these drastic consequences. Um, where on the one hand, um, we have 
um, journal editors insisting that climate scientists scale back their language. And on the other hand, we've got the president of COP28 uh, saying that there is no science behind demands for phase out of fossil fuels. This happened just literally yesterday. So um, we're living in that moment. And part of this language mediation filtering is that the very concept of climate change also functions in two meanings. One is this specific scientific technical definition, which you see anywhere, if you go online and Wikipedia's definition is uh, usually highlighted as, as this long-term shift in temperatures and weather patterns caused by human activities, especially the burning of fossil fuels. That's a sort of general understanding. But, uh, uh, but there is also a wider, less specific street level understanding of climate change as a symptom of and a label for everything that is systemically destructive in our current civilization, where climate change is this, is this a flag to rally under, to challenge not just global warming or greenhouse gas emissions, but to challenge other forms of violence against the planet inherent in the current status quo arrangement to challenge biodiversity loss, monocrop agriculture, nitrogen flows, ocean pollution, extractivism, energy systems, banking and finance systems, corporate power, human supremacy, white supremacy, violence against poor and BIPOC communities, food labels, food deserts, deforestation, wealth inequality, meat and dairy industry, and 10,000 other things. So like there is this sense and among scientists also that to actually successfully solve climate change in this narrow sense, we need to address all these other challenges at the same time. So climate change in this broad definition means all of those different things, even though they are very often treated as disparate entities, different parts. So climate literacy, the, the kind of climate literacy that we promote is about these this multitude of 10,000 things where climate change, the narrow definition sits at the center. Uh, so here's another helpful term that I um, especially appreciate. And it comes from eco-philosopher Timothy Morton. Uh, and he calls the climate crisis a hyper object. And Morton defines hyper object as a massive system that is at once everywhere, but ungraspable in its entirety. Um, so it's always connected to us. Um, even if um, it's super apparent or even if we can't see it. Um, and so it's for this reason that engaging climate literacy as a narrative capacity is invaluable, as Merrick was saying, the 10,000 things. Um, because when climate literacy is honed through engagement with stories, we can learn to see and name those things, the challenges, the complex connections among places, factors, actors, systems, people, and conceptualize alternatives. So for instance, we might ask, um, how do we help young people understand what climate justice is and how to achieve it? Or what connects and connections exist between climate injustice and wealth inequality, social class, race, uh, poisoned water and soil and food deserts? Um, so in other words, um, how do we share the big picture of the systemic challenges with young people, yet ground them in a personal understanding of specific ideas and concepts? We believe this is the work for stories. Because one of the many things stories are good for is concept mapping. That is anchoring our understanding of specific concepts in specific stories so that when you are done reading that story, you have that very tangible connection to the concept and you never forget it and you understand it more deeply. Um, and to this end, I want to do a read aloud. Um, and the picture book that I want to read is called The Fate of Fosto by Oliver Jeffers. It's one of my favorites. Um, it's a story that we use with teachers, both pre-service and in-service. Um, and the teachers that have used this in their classrooms use it to generate discussions about um, concepts that range from human expansionism to Anthropocene to deep time to the rights of nature. And so as I read this, I want you to note one thing, and then um, also uh, think about another. So the thing I want you to note is that this book does not explicitly announce it is about the climate crisis, but it's obvious it is. Um, the second thing I want you to think about is what other connections you make to this story. I've named a few, but there are plenty more. And so as I read, you will make those connections, and I want you just to hang on to them. Um, I also want you to enjoy. So without further ado, 
This is The Fate of Faustin by Oliver Jeffers. There is once a man who believed he owned everything, and he set out to survey what was his. You are mine, said Fausto to the flower. Yes, said the flower, I am yours. Content, Fausto walked on. Sorry. You are mine, he said to the sheep. Yes, said the sheep, I suppose I am. Feeling satisfied, Fausto walked on. Next, Fausto came upon a tree and declared, Tree, you are mine. To which the tree replied, Oh, all right, I can be yours. And the tree bowed before the man. This pleased Fausto. So he walked on, happy to be owning a sheep and a flower and his tree. Before long, Fausto had claimed a field and a forest and a lake. But at first, the lake had pretended not to hear. But Fausto showed that lake who was boss. When he reached a mountain, Fausto said in a clear voice, Mountain, you are mine. No, said the mountain. I am my own. This angered Fausto and he stamped his foot and made a fist. Still, the mountain would not move. But Fausto put up such a fight you would not believe, and he showed that mountain who was boss. So eventually, the mountain bowed before Fausto and said, Yes, you are in charge. I am yours. Feeling very important now, Fausto easily conquered a boat and set off to sea. For a mountain, a lake, a forest, a field, a tree, a sheep, and a flower were not enough for him. When he had gotten far enough from shore, Fausto said in a clear voice, See, you are mine. But the sea was silent. You belong to me, sea. I know you can hear me, said Fausto louder still. Then, after a while, the sea said quietly, You do not own me. You're wrong, I do, Fausto replied, unsure which way to look, for the voice appeared to come from everywhere. You do not even love me, said the sea. You are wrong again, said the man. I love you very much. But Fausto was lying, and the sea knew it. How can you love me when you do not understand me? The sea asked Fausto. Oh, you are wrong a third time, said Fausto. I understand you deeply. And then he added, feeling impatient, now... Admit you are mine, or I will show you who is boss. And how will you do that? asked the sea. Well, I will stamp my foot and make a fist. If you wish to stamp your foot, then come show me how it is done so I understand. And in order to show his anger and importance, Fausto climbed overboard to stamp his foot on the sea. Now, if y'all were a class of elementary students, I might pause now and say, make a prediction about what's going to happen next. So you can do that on your own. But Fausto did not understand. And he did not know how to swim. The sea was sad for him, but carried on being the sea. The mountain, too, went back to its business. And the lake, and the forest, the field, and the tree, the sheep, and the flower carried on as before. For the fate of Fausto did not matter to them.
Okay. This was, thank you, Nick. This was The Fate of Foster by Oliver Jeffers. And this is just one of the many, many, many stories we use at the center to work with teachers by and with developing very specific strategies. Nick mentioned concept mapping, which is grounding very specific concepts in tangible examples from stories. We also have systems thinking, the CLIC framework, which is the climate literacy uh, competencies and knowledges framework. So there is a set of very specific tools that we use with stories. So stories always need working with. They don't speak for themselves or stories are best engaged in a group where people can discuss what it is that they're seeing, reading, or what questions the stories raise. And this building of climate literacy with stories is super important, not just because stories are fun, but because stories are language technologies for rewiring our minds and upgrading our minds to ecocentric thought patterns. And like many scholars in the environmental humanities and social sciences, we believe that climate change is not primarily a challenge to our technologies, to our economy, or even to our politics. It is a challenge to our story systems. Our future will be determined by developments in the space of language and imagination, by whether we are able to embrace new values and new ways of thinking, a new ethic of partnership with the non-human, a, a new story about who we are as a species in relation to all life on the planet. So one big challenge for us now is that we must, as a species, find a new emotionally compelling story ca capable of mobilizing social adaptation to the realities of this climate altered, altered world in which we already live. Which brings me to our third point, systems change. So across all climate organizations among environmentalists, energy and sustainability people, conservation people, policy people, even IPCC, it is now universally accepted that we need systems change. Back in 2018, uh, when IPCC called for rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of our society. Uh, this has been, uh, so when, when IPCC articulated this, this need for rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes, this was one version of saying that we need systems change. And the thing is that although IPCC and any other official bodies of the current dominant order, they will not say it explicitly, but the postulate for system change means a de facto acknowledgement that the main systems of our current global civilization are legal, economic, political, educational, technological, social structures. All of these systems were designed without concern for the biosphere. They were designed and have proven to be incapable of redesigning themselves to the extent that they can slow down, let alone reverse the demolition of the planet. And these systems were actually designed for the Holocene, a stable, predictable, abundant, and forgiving planetary environment. They, these systems take the planet as an inexhaustible and indestructible resource for humans to exploit, no matter what we do, how much we kill, burn, exterminate, extract, like there's always more. This is the core operational principle of these systems. And this is how we arrived at the Anthropocene. We know now that all the assumptions Merrick outlined were wrong. Um, and the current system in which we live is driving us to the to the edge of ecosystem collapse, um, which could also be a collapse of human civilization as we understand it. Um, so the need for systems change really means that um, tweaks in the existing system, that is the existing extractive, market-driven, growth-addictive system, will not be enough to ensure the planet's habitability. What we need instead is to reinvent everything. That's energy, transportation, economy, healthcare, food, everything around ecocentric values 
priorities and commitments. And this is the, the new vision that we, among many other organizations like U350, we follow. So it's not unchanged minds and old visions, but with new programs. No, we need to change minds and pursue new visions. And of course, the, the question is, okay, how do you enact system change? So there was a moment uh, for a while we thought that popular pressure through mass activism will do the job. And uh, 350 was created in 2007, and it was one of the pioneering organizations created specifically to, or, to unite ordinary people around climate activism. And we're very uh, grateful and proud that uh, Bill McKibben, one of the founders of 350.org is also um, our advisor at the Center for Climate Literacy. So, uh, so 350 was part of the first wave of climate change activism oriented organizations. The second wave of organizing happened in the 20 teens. So this was in part as a response to the emergence of authoritarianism, neo-fascism, neo-feudal neo billionaire class, all of which were curiously aligned with the interests of the fossil fuel lobby. So for, for example, Project Drawdown and the Sunrise Movement, they were both created in 2017. In 2018, Extinction Rebellion was created. Gre Greta Thunberg started her solo strike. In 2019, inspired by Greta, we saw School Strike for Climate, which became Fridays for Future. And as always, so there's a bunch, there's tons of organizations all over the world. And as always, native and indigenous leaders in climate resistance were way ahead of white organizers. Honor the Earth was founded in 1993, Earth Charter and Charter of Indigenous People in early 2000s. So, but of course, indigenous resistance really registered for the first time on everyone's radars in 2016 with the Dakota Access Pipeline protests. So these and other organizations have achieved much, but by the time the COVID hit in 2020, one thing was clear. It was clear that no amount of volunteer climate activism would be enough. So increasingly, and this is what we get from a large body of climate activist literature, that increasingly people realize that, okay, we are in for the long haul. We need climate commitment rather than one-time activism. And the consensus sort of shifted toward an understanding that, yes, we need mass scale collective work across professional fields, such as advocated by uh, uh, Nicola Alexander, who's, uh, who's the, uh, on Project Drawdown Labs, Climate Majority Project. Um, this is Rupert Reed in the UK. But we also need to do climate commitments in our professional lives, in whatever you do as a job. And I think it was in 2020 or 2021 that Project Drawdown was one of the first organizations to launch this notion of job function action guides. So the idea, okay, you do this work in your professional capacity, but they have suggestions for only eight types of professions from finance to HR to legal, marketing, product management, those kinds of professions. But what about education? Yes, education is not listed in Project Drawdown's job action guides, and it should be. Um, education is an extremely large and complex system of our civilization. And I'm speaking from um, experience as a former classroom teacher. Um, uh, and it involves a massive uh, population across the world and in the United States. Um, and just in the United States, we have roughly 50 million students in public K-12, plus 4 million teachers. So in a population of about 300 million, that's one-sixth actively involved in the classroom, um, public K-12. When you add to this parents, families, caretakers, administrators, support staff, um, and add 17 million college students, a few million faculty, staff, their families, that's nearly a quarter of the population of the United States who are directly participating in education on a daily basis. So think about the change we could achieve if we change that system of education. Um, and like I said, 
um, in my experience as a classroom teacher, I know education is not easy to change. It's both centralized and decentralized simultaneously. Um, it's highly regulated um, and subject to um, who knows how many policies across multiple levels, um, which means that outsiders um, have very few or no tools to actually change it. Um, and I am more than willing to list all the things that are wrong and dysfunctional about education. I come from Iowa. If you've been paying attention to Iowa political news um, and what they've been doing to Iowa education, um, you know my values. But um, to even have a chance at transitioning to an ecological civilization, if we're thinking about a quarter of the population of the United States being in education, we also need to change education. Um, how do we go about doing this? At the center, we don't want to wait for departments of education, state, federal, local governments to mandate climate education. Um, in Iowa, it's probably going to be the last state to do it anyway. Um, but we think this work can and should be done on the ground already within existing educational structures and with teachers um, who are already serving in actual classrooms, serving actual students, um, and those teachers serving as leaders. Um, for climate literacy in, in every classroom. Um, so climate literacy education with stories can function separately or it can complement climate science education. So the climate literacy education that we imagine can take place in any classroom, uh, history, civics, third grade math, um, secondary Chinese immersion. Um, and so when students move from class to class, they're not leaving climate literacy behind they're experiencing it in a new context. Um, and when they do this, it becomes normalized through discussions and projects and activities. Um, they take it home with them. They talk to it about their caregivers at home on the weekends. Um, and this impact is both direct, deep, and it's part of everybody's everyday learning and not just an extracurricular activity. So, we believe at the center that young people have a right to know about the climate emergency to make their own judgments. They have a right to know, and often already do, that states, corporations, and other main players in the current economic system have all incentives to cling on to the fantasy that we can carry on the way we've done before. And young people have a right to know that institutions that created the climate emergency have not been able to stop it, and may not be able to stop it in time. This is really hard knowledge, but young people have a right to hear it. And this is where climate literacy education comes in. The kind of education that empowers students with the conceptual and emotional tools, with the courage, with the honesty to see our predicament for what it is, to see what brought us here, to be able to reflect on where we go from here. We believe that this is realistic and tangible. It's a realistic and tangible way forward because it is grassroots action for teachers. Just last week, I was in a class with pre-service teachers and they were asking, well, what can we do? What action can we actually do? This, this is it. Um, as, so as teacher educators and teachers ourselves, Merrick and I and the other folks affiliated with the center, we're insiders to education. And so we are positioned uniquely um, to help lead this and then facilitate it. Um, we can implement it at the U and in the other institutions of which we are a part um, in our teacher training programs, teacher professional development programs, and then go from there. Um, I'm fond of saying that this work is existentially important. Um, because when uh, our petro civilization starts to unravel, climate literacy education will become more urgent and more important in schools everywhere. Um, and all of a sudden, one day, everybody's going to want it. There's going to be a project warp speed for climate literacy. Um, and our job at the center is to ensure that we're ready to meet that need with tested practices, strategies, and approaches um, that can be scaled up, ready to go, and uh, be implemented even within the existing system. And we also believe that this work is revolutionary. It is revolutionary because it brings together two large systems of our civilization. One is education, and Nick has already talked about it. But the other system is the story system, 
books, films, games, authors, publishers, illustrators, creators, libraries, media companies, and all other spaces where stories live. This work brings these two systems together. And it's also revolutionary because the strategies for teaching climate literacy we propose are practical, modular, scalable, and easy to integrate in your teaching at any level. So imagine teachers across all grade levels and subject areas, plugging in stories to build students' climate literacy from pre-K through high school. Imagine this happening in all schools everywhere. Imagine teachers getting the resources, training, and support, including funding, to incorporate more and more and more of climate literacy education in their classrooms. Imagine academic scholars and teacher educators working with teachers to prepare these resources. Imagine publishers sending us book copies to work with. Imagine teachers mentoring other teachers in workshops, in summer institutes, in conferences for which they are paid. Imagine everyone involved in this work, teachers, librarians, authors, academics, school administrators, all others sharing their experiences and tips in online events or publishing them in an open access journal so that more educators can read about this work and more educators can implement these models. So this is our vision of how we build a global community dedicated to universal climate literacy education. If you can imagine this, you have just imagined a grassroots revolution that has the potential to transform education into this ecocentric engine of transformation, taking us not toward collapse, but toward an ecological civilization. And we are about ready to talk about the actual work that we have done and are doing at the center, um, the specific steps forward along the lines of work that Merrick just mentioned. Um, and to transition to that um, conversation. And then afterwards we'll um, have Q&A. Um, I wanna read just an excerpt from this excellent book called Only One. Um, this is an excellent book for talking about deep time with young people, um, about collective action, about youth action, agroforestry. There's a bunch of stuff you can do with it, um, but I'm only gonna read the end. So what you need to know about this book is that um, in the beginning pages, there's a young character um, who looks a lot like Greta Thunberg, um, and she's narrating to the reader, um, hey, look, there's only one planet. It started with the Big Bang. Um, four billion years passed. The solar system came to be. There um, are so many planets in the solar system, so many continents. Um, the Earth's been around for so long. Um, and it is an incredibly rich and diverse place to live because on Earth, there are 8 million, 700,000 different kinds of creatures live on Earth. We call each kind of creature a species. So this is the Greta Thunberg character narrating. Earth has more than 10,000 species of birds, 25,000 species of fish, and 900,000 species of bugs. It has trees great and small, flowers of all colors, vegetables, mosses, mushrooms, mammals, and thousands of tiny, tiny creatures. Some are too small to see with their eyes, so we use a microscope. Our Earth holds all this life along with us, more than 7 billion human beings. But though there are 7 billion of us, we are each unique, with bodies, brains, fingerprints, and feelings all our own. Around the world, people wear different clothes, eat different foods, and speak many languages. Yet together, we are part of one human family in the great diversity of life. One, only one. Earth is our one and only planet to care for, love, and preserve. One, only one. The story ends where it began with only one. And now, part two, the Center for Climate Literacy. Merrick? Yes. So um, we briefly want to talk about five major lines of work that we do. Um, and the first one is a literature database called Climate Lit. Uh, so you have the list of these. So literature database, Climate Literacy and Education, which is an open access pocket journal. 
then professional development, which is all kinds of trainings for teachers, community building, so building connections and networks so that this work can happen everywhere. And then there's also research, which is our fifth line of work. Um, Climate Lit Database, uh, it's a separate website where we are collecting something like reviews of books, films, games, apps, and other narrative media in which stories live. But these are more like encyclopedia entries. And the notion is that we tag these stories by keywords and themes. So for example, you're looking for oceans and uh, reefs and marine life, marine pollution, and something, 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 and a bunch of other keywords. And you put these keywords in the database and it throws at you all kinds of books and stories and short stories or picture books or whatever we have already in the database that you can use for your lesson plans. So the notion behind this literature database is to build it up. And we have dozens, we need to have hundreds of people working on this, contributing entries. These entries are highly structured and they are organized in such a way that we are building resources. So teachers at any grade level for any topic, they can choose specific resources and build lesson plans around these or including these stories uh, through the database. And this database is also connected in part to our open access journal called Climate Literacy and Education. So we have um, almost two complete issues out. Our second issue will be closed at the end of this month. Um, and I love working on it. I think it's a very novel um, and practical resource for educators, scholars, and students. So um, it's open access, meaning that y'all can open this up um, right now if you wanted to. And it'll be linked on the resource guide that gets sent out later. Um, and it's a pocket journal, meaning that um, even as it is peer reviewed and has a DOI, so it's an official scholarly journal, um, all of the articles that we publish are less than 1500 words, because this is meant to be practitioner um, focused. So if you are an in-service educator um, and you want to find out more about climate literacy or nearby nature, or how to teach um, books about water to a ninth grade class, you can find these articles um, and it cuts through the methodological and theoretical fluff to give you the information that you need to know. And this is again, me as an in-service, a former in-service educator, knowing that teachers are um, incredibly intelligent and adept people, and they have less than zero time. Um, and so this is meant to, to be helpful for them. And we publish teachers also. So um, we've worked with several teachers already who have developed lesson plans using the Climate Lit database, and they published um, their lesson plans in the journal for other um, educators to access. So um, uh, this, this is the sort of scholarly leg of our um, uh, public and collective conversation about what climate literacy is and how it can live in the lives of students and teachers. Um. Our other leg is professional development. So this is something that we have a team of uh, instructors, faculty, scholars, and researchers at the University of Minnesota, but also across the United States and worldwide. I think we have members from 12 different countries now. But this work needs to happen on grassroots level everywhere. So our goal is to train teachers and give teachers resources and skills so that these teachers can then go on and train other teachers and then build their own networks in school districts and states everywhere. So we have a bunch of different, um, different professional development options and we are developing these as much as we can with the as quickly as we can. But then there's something that we failed to mention at the start that our center is only slightly more than a year old. So we're, we're, we've been around doing this work for maybe 16, 18 months. Uh, so it's still a very early stage of development. But this professional development is super important. It needs to happen on a massive, massive scale involving hundreds, probably thousands of teachers and over extended periods of time. And 
this work also involves building relationships with community members, other institutions and organizations such as 350 Chicago. So a lot of what we do is um, outreach with other organizations and um, partners and, and build those relationships. So um, we work a lot with organizations um, in the community, again, like 350 Chicago. Um, we work with school districts. We work um, with institutions of higher ed in the U.S. and worldwide. Merrick gave a talk at FinCon this past summer. Um, so we're trying to have this conversation as often as possible in as diverse um, context as possible. Um, one thing we've not talked um, a lot about in this uh, presentation, but that we do take very seriously is our relationship with um, authors and illustrators. So um, we've got, um, we have good relationships with um, authors and illustrators who create climate oriented stories for young people to encourage them to continue doing that, but also to connect them with educators um, and students. So um, this is another way, both formally and informally, that we try to extend this conversation, again, through presentations like this, through consultations, um, and, and as much as we can do. And of course, because we are, many of us are academic scholars, we are building research around this. And this research is both in literature, in education, this is research across very specific disciplines of, in social science. And this, is, this involves publications, partnerships, conference presentations, panels, discussions. So we, we're trying to do as much as we can and build a robust network of scholars in whatever fields they are dedicated to this climate literacy conversation. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mary. Yeah, and okay, current work. Okay, this is important because um, we are, so we have more ideas and very specifically articulated things that we know that we want to do than we have the capacity to actually do at this point in terms of personnel, and of course, also in ter terms of, of money. So one, this is, we just put a bunch of things that, that we are trying to prioritize for this coming year. So we are trying to create a document, a sort of children's right to climate literacy, which will be modeled on a United Nations declaration. And this will be a formal uh, starting point for development of a, climate literacy core standards and structure. So like what happens if you zoom out and think about what needs to be learned in kindergarten, then in first grade, second, third, and so forth. So like, what is the progression? What are the ideas? How do we build this? This will be a massive project involving dozens of scholars from various institutions that this will of course need to be a large sponsored project over two or three years. But we know that we need to develop these climate literacy core standards and assessment. We at the University of Minnesota, where we want to build a climate literacy minor from, for uh, teachers or teacher candidates. So this will be four specific courses that bring together what we know and all of the research existing so that these teachers, when they leave our teacher program, they already know what to do in their schools. We are doing working on guides to different climate literacy concepts. And I know that we, we just recently produced a zine, our first zine on what is climate literacy, um, which I think we will be sharing with you after this presentation. Um, and, and that's just the tip of the iceberg of the current work that we do um, in the team that we have. Yes, the, the tip of the iceberg and some of the larger projects. So for instance, the climate literacy core standards, that will be a multi-year, um, I mean, could be dozens, if not up to a hundred folks involved, it'll be pretty substantial. Um, and th that's on top of and integrated with the sort of uh, more daily work uh, of what we do. And I want to give you a little glimpse at the infrastructure. Um, and uh, right now, Almost the entirety of our work over the past 16 months has been done on a volunteer basis. Merrick and I both teach full-time, um, as well as most of the other folks affiliated with the center. Um, and we do this because we're committed to providing a better, more ecological future for humans today um, and tomorrow. Um, but as Merrick's already said, 
volunteers at a single institution will not be enough to spark the change necessary for system-wide transformation. Transformation. Um, we need to scale up. Um, get teachers in every classroom to talk with students about climate literacy. Um, and to do this, we need to provide people with the means to do this work, not as a hobby, but as a serious paid work to which they can devote their fullest energies and attentions. Again, I'm speaking as a former classroom teacher um, and teachers, as y'all likely know, are already asked to do 10 million things and they aren't compensated for it. So a key part of this model is shifting funding to pay people to do this work and recognize it um, as existentially important. Um, and right now at the center, given the infrastructure we already have um, in terms of plans and personnel, we could put over $100 million to work in the next year. We already have those plans. We could start tomorrow. And if we had this funding, we could triple our scale in less than a year. And from then, it's just exponential as teachers train teachers and teachers train teachers, and this thing scales up. Um, so that's the financial piece. And here you see kind of a snapshot of what each individual thing will entail. Um, but we also welcome and actively invite everyone to get involved. Um, so Merrick, if you could advance the slide just one, um, you'll get a sense of some of the things that you can do to advance climate literacy. So um, if you're a caregiver, if you got young people in your home, read with that young person and encourage them to ask questions. Um, we don't have all the answers. Um, and having those conversations with young people, as Merrick said earlier, while reading is really key. You can also talk to teachers um, at local school districts and encourage um, folks to adopt climate literacy education at their schools. If you're a teacher, you can join our team as a teacher fellow, and we'll share a QR code and a link at the end um, for you to join. Um, we have um, accessible professional developments um, and opportunities to connect with other folks because, again, this is grassroots, so that community is really important, and um, we're um, more than eager to facilitate it. Um, and if you are a concerned earthling, um, you can lobby schools and politicians, you can donate, spread the word, connect us with people that you know. This talk happened because Dr. Richard Foss connected us with Babette and Larry. So um, those are just a few of the ways that you can help. And we're about ready to turn to Q&A, um, and I'm really excited to start that conversation. Um, but I want to say just um, a few final things. So as an educator who's worked with young people of all ages, um, I have a practice of asking those young people what they want their elders to know about their experience of the climate crisis. Um, I love that question because it allows young people to just show how um, uh, attentive and caring um, and thoughtful they, they really are. Um, and about a month ago, I asked this question to one of um, the center's new undergraduate assistants. And I asked this question to this undergraduate and they said that they want their elders to know that they watched their first documentary about climate change when they were in third grade. And they have thought about climate change every single day since. And they said they still have hope. Um, we live in an age of multiple crises. Um, the earth shouts to us, it's in pain, it's angry, um, and that we need a new vision and new stories to inspire us to get to a better, more ecological future. Every, with every step that we take towards building young people's climate literacy, we're laying the foundations for that future. Incorporating stories, story-based activities, we have the opportunity to revolutionize education from within without waiting for standards and incentives and governments to trickle down from state or federal levels. So um, let's do this work together and let's rejoice in this collective work as a celebration of our shared care commitments in our shared humanity. Yeah.